Welcome to another episode of the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast with your host, Andrew Langer. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. I'm your host, Andrew Langer. And if you're watching us on YouTube, check us out wherever fine podcasts are purveyed. If you're listening to us on one of those fine podcast platforms and you want to see what me and my guests look like, uh, check us out on YouTube. Leave us a review. Leave us a, a rating. Tell your friends and your family members about it. Very excited. This is our Thanksgiving special show today. Uh, and I wanted to have special guests on f- for this to sort of talk about Thanksgiving, but also talk about what's happening in the world. Joining me today are both Nick Gillespie and Sarah Siskin. Uh, Nick Gillespie is an editor at large at Reason, the libertarian magazine of free minds and free markets. And he's the host of the Reason interview with Nick Gillespie. Nick Gillespie is to libertarianism what Lou Reed is to rock and roll, the quintessence of its outlaw spirit. That was written by Robert Draper in New York Times Magazine. He also went on to say for the last 20 years, Gillespie has been a writer, editor, and intellectual godfather for reason, the movement's leaning journal since its founding in 1968. The Daily Beast named him one of the right's top 25 journalists, something we are going to get into because I'm sure Nick appreciated being called part of the right. Uh, but they also called him clear-headed, brainy, and among the foremost libertarians in America. I think that's true. Uh, he served as editor-in-chief uh, of Reason.com and Reason TV from 2008 to 2017 and was the Reason Magazine's editor-in-chief from 2000 to 2008. He's appeared everywhere. I'll, 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 I'll skip down through your bio a little bit, Nick. Uh, he is almost certainly uh, the only journalist to have interviewed both Ozzy Osbourne and Nobel laureates in economics, such as Milton Friedman and Vernon Smith. He received his PhD in English literature from SUNY Buffalo, an MA in English from Temple University, and a BA in English and psychology from Rutgers. He's the co-author of a book that changed my world, uh, The Declaration of Independence, How Libertarian Politics Can Fix What's Wrong with America. He wrote that with Matt Welsh. And joining us as well is Sarah Rose Siskin. She's a Some asshole. That's a good enough biography. I think that's... <laughs> Listen, Sarah, I, I appreciate this, but you have a, you have a, an excellent bio in your own right. She is a science comedy writer based in New York City, the co-founder of SciCom, a company that combines science, communication, and comedy to help science and tech-oriented people get their message across. Sarah is also a psychedelic stand-up comedian, which means she's only funny when you're on psychedelics, and her show was written up in The New Yorker. Previously, she's written comedy from an artificially intelligent robot named Sophia at Hanson Robotics and was the lead writer for Star Talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson, a TV show on National Geographic. She's written comedy for the White House Correspondents' Dinner, an event that definitely needs excellent comedy. And her Harvard cum laude thesis is on comedy itself. Sarah and Nick, thank you so very much for joining us. I'm sorry, you both want to jump in here. I see you both. Yeah, want to I say just something. I want to ask, but has Sarah interviewed Ozzy Osbourne? <laughs> <laughs> Or Nobel laureates at the same time. I mean, that's I think listen, she's she's talked to a couple of Nobel laureates. I well, think you know, is the podcast over now? Was it all? Yes, yeah. it's over now. Yes, listen, yeah. you know, it's it's one of those things. This is uh, resume the, read by Andrew Langer <laughs> on the on the late uh, on the podcast of the late Gilbert Gottfried. Yeah. He used to always wanted to append to the lengthy bios he would read of his guests found alone, dead in their apartment at age whatever. <laughs> so that's you know, the, you tend to read them as though they're eulogies. But you know, so let me start there. Before we talk about Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving traditions, and 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 uh, by the way, Nick and Sarah are married to each other. Almost, yeah. we're domestic partners. We're engaged. Yeah. Oh, you're engaged. Everybody, all the listeners, you still have a chance. That's what. That there means. you go. Good, 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 good. good. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, the door is swinging shut, but the, you know, you can maybe get out of the the bank vault before. Let me let me start here about bucket list interviews for both of you, right? Because, I, Nick, you've interviewed, as you said, as it says, you've interviewed Nobel laureates as well as Ozzy Osbourne. Uh, Sarah, you've worked with Neil deGrasse Tyson. I know for me, my bucket list interviews, Pete Townsend mm. is on that list. Uh, Joni Mitchell probably at the top of that list. Mm. Um, what about for you guys, bucket list interviews? Uh, Sarah, whichever one of you, Sarah, Nick, whichever one of you wants to go first. Oh, I hate to be that jerk, but fr- I got it already. Okay. Um, <laughs> like <sighs> being, a- I, <laughs> yeah, no, being able to interview Neil deGrasse Tyson, my former boss was um, just really awesome because you don't have to do anything. You give him <laughs> one question and then he goes the entire time. So right. 
Um, in addition to saying profound, awesome stuff that is like poetic, uh, you also don't have to do any work. Sure. Nick? Uh, you know, uh, to pick up on your musical thread, I, I would throw out Bob Dylan. <clears throat> okay. Bob Dylan, uh, the Minutemen, the uh, post-punk band from uh, from Southern California, had a song where they talked about punk music and they said, this is Bob Dylan to me. But it's like Bob Dylan is Bob Dylan to me and I would love sure. to. Although I, I think it would be a completely infuriating conversation. Not only he would, to listen to, but to actually participate <laughs> in. It would, would make it so nevertheless, nevertheless, you want to go there. So let's let's start here, um, you know, with with the fact that you guys are engaged. Mm-hmm. You were at Burning Man. You were Sarah, you were at Burning Man with Nick, I I as as I recall. Yes? Yes, yeah. We I, were at the so, um, very, you know, nothing happened, nothing newsworthy at Burning Man 2023. <laughs> But let's talk about this because I've never gone. I know, you know, my colleague Grover Norquist goes, other other folks go, you know, conservatives and libertarians alike. Talk about Burning Man and how Burning Man has changed over the years. But what is the significance of this massive event that's held in the desert every summer? Well, I mean, it's I've been going slightly longer than Nick. This was his virgin burn. So it was very exciting. Really? Yeah, yeah. we got to mess with him. The a lot. 60 year old virgin. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, the Burning Man is really a wonderful concept. It's sort of like um, it makes both the right and the left unhappy because it's like both very um, anarcho-capitalist in some ways and also like deeply communist in other ways. So that's always good. Um, and it's yeah, it's a week long gathering where like you gather in um, de- in, in Nevada in a desert outside uh, Reno and it's completely barren landscape that has literally so little of life on it that there aren't even any bugs. It's such a hostile climate. Wow. And within a week, it takes a week to build and about uh, about a week after uh, everyone's at the festival itself to clean up, um, a whole city is built with its own radio station, newspaper, um, you know, hospital services. I volunteer near the hospital. Um, uh, affiliated program. And it's just like this self-contained city. Everybody brings their own supplies. Um, and so there is no, the economy is a gifting economy, which is kind of okay. interesting and bizarre to experiment yep. with. And it's just like the, I strongly recommend it to any of the most, even skeptical viewers or listeners right now. I have been planning on going for okay. years. And then Sarah is the one who finally got me out to the playa. And um, yeah, it's fantastic. And it is, uh, Andrew, it's a great testament to kind of human creativity and innovation sure. and just kind of self-organizing activity. I mean, it's, as Sarah was saying, it's, you know, people come out and they terraform the desert for a couple of weeks and then break it down and pull everything out as if nothing happened. Um, wow. It's kind of like you know, it's a it's a an artistic brigadoon or something like it okay. pops into a being and goes away. And it's exhilarating to, uh, you know, to participate in that. Do you have to partake of psychedelics in order to get no. the full Burning Man experience? No, no. no and there's an not. AA, you know, among, you know, like, you know, I think Frank Zappa said, you know, in order to be a country, you need a beer and an airline. Okay. It's like you also need an AA chapter and there's like, <laughs> there, you know, there's AA at Burning Man. And, you know, what's great about it um, and the, the founder of it was very libertarian ish, but it's, you know, it's you can do what you want or not. I mean, it's all yeah. voluntary free association. It's truly like catching society. And so you choose your own name. You can have pancakes for dinner. You can be nocturnal. It's just like. A real, it's true freedom, like outside of any system. Strongly recommend. Uh, Grover Norquist comes, so all you yeah. writers like come. It's really amazing. I love the fact that Grover, for years, from what I understand, has parked his RV, his Burning Man RV, outside one of the uh, the brothels, uh, the legal brothels in in, in Nevada, to, to mm-hmm. get there. At least that's what I've heard. That's again yep. a rumor. We also. We parked our tents next to Kidsville, which is where people bring their families. So it's like there's wow. all multi generational now at this point. Now that there's like older burners, it's like there's many different types of Burning Man. Listen, speaking of many different types of things and many different shades, let's talk about as I said in the beginning uh, in the overlong intro. 
that the Declaration of Independence literally, quite literally changed my viewpoint in terms of politics. I was working, and Nick, you've heard this, Sarah, I, I may have said this to you at some point, that, you know, I read the Declaration of Independence and I was a, a, a party official for a particular political party. And I said, you know something, this process is a dead end. There is no life here. I need to, you know, I'm out, I'm done. And, and, I, and I gave up my, my position with, with the political party. Um, and I've talked quite a bit about what you guys, what you and Matt talk about, which is this, uh, the libertarian moment mm -hmm. um, and the importance therein. But like everything else, we can talk about the fractures in the Democratic Party. We can talk about the fractures in the Republican Party. We can talk about fractures within the movements, within the conservative movement, the progressive movement. The libertarian party, is it a very unique and, and I think in many ways distressing, though I, I might say predictable place but also the small L libertarian movement generally, right? As you ask a, a libertarian how they define libertarian, I'm sorry, you ask five libertarians how they define libertarianism, you'll get a dozen answers and they're all at the end of it be yelling at each other. Both of you, because you come at this from two somewhat different perspectives here, I want to get both, both of your thoughts on, on where the, the small L libertarian movement is and where the big L libertarian party is in 2023. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I think the big L Libertarian Party in 2023 is doing very poorly. Um, I think even their officials recognize that they had um, there was a kind of redirection of the party that started a year ago at, at their uh, year and a half ago at their Reno convention where they kind of set the agenda and new management took over. And it's not doing well in terms of generating party members or donations. I think to some degree that reflects the libertarian movement broadly based is going through a kind of crack up in many ways, just like, you know, the right, the left, the you know liberals, conservatives, progressives, you name it. Um, I think what's important uh, to get to the idea, you know, that's in the Declaration of Independence and that undergirds the libertarian moment is the idea that we've entered an age of mass personal personalization and individualization of an, you know, a recognition we have more choices across every aspect of how to live our lives. And we need to keep coming back to that. I, I think of libertarian as an adjective, as a direction, as a temperament. And it's an operating system where, you know, how do you get as many people as possible together and you create an operating system that allows them to pursue a meaningful life with as little violence and friction as possible? And I think we're overdue for kind of stressing that again, that, you know, the, the goal of America is not to have everybody vote or march in one direction. It's to create a, a kind of coral reef, uh, you know, or a Windows operating system, where as many individual programs can flourish without crashing the <laughs> whole system. Sarah, yeah. uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, like, you know, my lengthy bio does not scream libertarian <laughs> for many of those but i did work for reason i yes. left because my boss was too hot and so um <laughs> where i am now no i i did i do have some libertarian bona fides work for pacific research institute and john stossel um mm -hmm. i kind of like yeah the big l libertarians suck so hard and then like i just Politics, you know, it's kind of the most libertarian thing in, in of all is to kind of just be a political in some sense. Yeah, sure. And so I take what I like about libertarians sort of, is that they are so consistent on just like valuing freedom and human emancipation. And then I take that as like a, a directive to what I do, which is a little bit more in the science and comedy world. And I just um, just try to apply the principle of like, a, you know, maximizing human freedom. And I think that's the thing that makes libertarians the best <laughs> is because yeah, they're yeah. just like truly a consistent party. You crack a history textbook, like the first reason magazine was like talking about the exact same shit they are now, which is why it's both infuriating and amazing uh, at the same time, because there's like still drugs aren't legalized and, you know, still they're like tax codes are ridiculously high and the deficit sucks. Um, but it's great because it's like the consistency feels like solid as opposed to the other parties where they like totally flip on everything. So I think it's like the state of the libertarian party is weak because of internal divisions and stupid culture war conversations, but it's strong because it's the only one, it's the only group that isn't hypocritical. Yeah. 
I, if I may, just to add on that, because this is something that Sarah, uh, conversations with her and whatnot have helped me kind of develop in this sense too. You know, I think libertarianism and I think America more broadly would benefit from kind of emphasizing the twin uh, kind of properties of autonomy and empathy. Right. Um, you know, we want people to have as much autonomy as possible to be able to make as many choices about really important things to them as possible. And then we want to be empathetic so that we're not always seeing people who do things differently and you know, who eat different foods for Thanksgiving, you know, on a kind of banal example, instead of seeing them as the other or the enemy or a problem that needs to be solved. We're like, oh, that's kind of interesting. You know, we can redo the Thanksgiving dinner without the slaughter of, you know, Indians. Right. right? Well, um, me... And that's, you know, maybe that's what we should be coming back to more and more, um, you know is how do how do we get along better it's, and learn from each other and kind of take delight in you know in in all the different ways we are human it's interesting because there was this essay that came out over the summer by a professor at george mason whose name is now escaping me about this idea of get in your car travel 50 miles in any direction obviously if you're on the coast you can't travel you know in the ocean but travel 50 miles outside of wherever you are watch me yes <laughs> and have a conversation with somebody, which is, I mean, you know, I had the benefit of when I was growing up, we would drive across country every summer. I had family in California. So we would spend six weeks. We'd drive two weeks out to California, two weeks in California, two weeks back. And I have the benefit of talking to people. We're in an environment now where it's never been easier to connect with people around the world, you know, let alone around the corner. Um, and yet we've never been more insulated from ideas that are different from us both of you talk a little bit about that dichotomy. Why, why, is, why are we at that point where, where we can't have a conversation with somebody 50 miles away, but it's never been easier to connect with somebody 6,000 miles away? Yeah, culture, I guess. Um, you know, like, uh, I think that, um, you know, I just did this conference um, the other week that was like, I got to talk with the, found the creator of ethernet which like is okay. amazing because i didn't even know that that has an inventor it's like somebody who invented apples it's like sure. so common and we were talking about connectivity and it's like yeah the internet has made people just like dramatically more interconnected but there has not been like rising cultural norms to accommodate that like there's yeah. a lot of um anonymity and just division that drives the language and it has kind of like rose to the level of the amount of connectivity we have and maybe surpassed it. Um, and so conversations just are not very um, productive. So I, yeah, I wish I had a better answer, Andrew, but. That's a good answer. No, I, it's a good answer. Well, you know, to, to continue with like kind of internet uh, uh, metaphors, the, you know, one of the great things about internet search when it happened was that you could do plus, 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 like you could keep right. adding things and you saw and what, you know, just uh, worlds that you couldn't even have imagined before you could inhabit them for a while or meet with people and things, I, you know, which is great. And again, I think in a real lot lived situation, we are doing more things as individuals than we ever thought possible. You know, however old you are, you can do more stuff now than you could when you were born. Um, but I think what has happened partly is that our identities have shifted to politics for a variety of reasons, but, and politics ultimately yeah. is a zero sum game. So mm -hmm. you, you know, you get a majority and then you shove whatever your thoughts are down the, you know, the throats of the minority. And it could be, you know, and we've seen this in elections, you know, where you win by a few thousand votes and you get to, you know, tell everybody how to live. Sure. So polit I think one of the things that we need to do is to kind of put politics in its proper place. There are you know, there are decisions that need to be made with a consensus and some people are not going to like the consensus, but we have to squeeze politics and the idea of a political identity into the smallest part of our lives so that we can do this more kind of freestyling where like, yeah. you know what, like we don't, we don't have to agree on everything because my living, my life is not taking anything away from you. In fact, I'm learning from you. You're learning from me. That yeah. doesn't happen in politics. And I think the rise of politics into the front and center of our the way we identify is part of the toxicity that we see everywhere around us. That's been a theme. I talked to Bob Levy from The Washington Post about this and Leon Panetta as well. And we all sort of agree that we are all spending way too much time shouting at and past each other. Listen, before I let you go, because I did want to make this about Thanksgiving, we've 
talked very little about it. Yeah. I, I, we could talk about traditions. You know something? Let me distill it down. What's the one go-to dish that's got to be on your Thanksgiving table? Uh, Nick, we're going to start with you. What's the one thing you have to have every Thanksgiving? Yeah. Uh, you know, my mother used to make uh, turnips, mashed turnips when I was really? a kid. We always hated them. And then I'm like, oh, that's really good. But <laughs> I want to go back to uh, lobster for Thanksgiving. Okay. You know, which was an early staple because it was considered a garbage food. Sure. Yes. An insect of the sea by uh, early New England or Englanders and even uh, uh, Native Americans. I think we should bring back lobster. I like that. I like that. Sarah? Um, between Nick being like uber, like keto and me being a vegetarian, <laughs> I am, we are a nightmare um, at sure. Thanksgiving. But I think what would be really great at Thanksgiving is if everybody served one dish that was authentic to what they served like way back when during the first Thanksgiving. So you could see okay. how shitty life was and how much <laughs> life has improved today. Sure. That's I, you know, something I may take that to heart as being the the gourmand that I am and being in charge of largely the Thanksgiving meal. I'm going to go back and try to find something that I'm going to I'm going to make this year. Guys, how do folks find out how do folks find out more about what you all are up to? Um, follow me, I guess, on social or you know, if you have any um, comedy needs because you are you're feeling too boring, um, check out my company hellosci.com. I guess those would be the channels. We'll absolutely do that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the easiest way is I'm on Twitter too much at, at Nick Gillespie, all one word, lowercase, or uh, go to reason.com. Clearly not enough to know that it's X, Nick. It's, Get with it. We still call uh, yeah. it Twitter. And I still formerly, call it Twitter. And I will. Formerly Twitter. Yes. I, yeah. You know, I, <laughs> I do not. I do not consent. Yes. Here, here. Well, guys, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. It was fun. Thank you. Guys, this has been another episode of The Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. I am your host, Andrew Langer. Again, check us out where they're fine. Podcasts are found. Enjoy the rest of your Thanksgiving dinner. This has been the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast, hosted by Andrew Langer. Check out the Federal Newswire's family of websites, as well as their social media stream. 